This is me in conversation with Colin Baker. Hello and welcome to the Nick Briggs podcast. The Nick Briggs <laughs> podcast. The world has been waiting. It's been waiting eagerly and here it is. Oh. And very soon it will never be again. Yeah, let's just delete just this his, file. He just stuck his glasses, arms in his eyes, trying to put them on because he had headphones on and then he's taken them off again. Why he needs glasses in order to talk to somebody via a microphone, I've no idea. I was checking the level. <laughs> And the, it's, and the, the it's still going on. Right. But if I left my glasses on, I wouldn't be able to see you if I looked up. Such <laughs> is the curse of old age. Don't now, I wanted to that. ask you a question, but you've already just told me that you won't remember. What? But when I just we first wanted, met? Yeah, when did we first meet? Well, I think you were in short trousers, a little fan asking for an autograph somewhere. <laughs> but you um, just made that up? Yeah. Uh. Um, do you know, I don't know. I, I can't remember whether you, you weren't an... You had been an actor, and, uh, and oh, I think you were working for one of those silly organisations that that sponge off we creatives by oh, yes. writing toot about us. Uh, am I right? <laughs> what are you alluding to? What were you, who were you working well, for? Well, I'll tell you when I first met you. Go on, then. It was when you were recording Doctor in Distress. Oh, shite. Hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, I was with the people who were making a video of it... For the release, uh, Doctor was, in Distress was a record for anyone who doesn't know. This was there. 1984. Was that when it was? Afraid it was. So we are talking 30 years. Yeah, but uh, we didn't have a good meeting because uh, it was the first time that I was ever supposed to do interviews. Because you know, I did a lot of those interviews. Yeah. Like, and, um, they gave me a microphone. And they said, "Go around and interview people," and I was very scared and inexperienced. So I wanted to get an interview with you, and I saw you for a moment. You were sort of standing available, free in the studio. This was, you know, uh, and I, and I went as I went towards you. Someone came up to you and started talking to you. So by the time I reached you with this whacking great microphone, <laughs> you were in the middle of a conversation, and you were having the conversation. You turned and you saw me standing there like a lemon as I was holding this microphone. And you went. You're not recording this, are you? This is a personal conversation. <laughs> I felt so terrible. And I just thought, he's right. I look like I'm eavesdropping on something personal with a, a huge <laughs> microphone. It was like, not subtle, you know. Anyway, and then you That would be the one of the few things that would make me behave like that. Yeah. But then you went, yes, yes, come on then, come on. <clears throat> and, and then we did some interview. And then later we met doing the Myth Makers interview where... We ah. were wandering around locations. It wasn't Bill Baggs then? That wasn't Bill Baggs. I think it was after that. that Post Baggins. But yeah. But yours was, the, 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 all the Myth Makers interviews I did, yours, yours was a turning point for me, actually. Because you were the first person who gave me some confidence. Because your attitude was, uh, well, you're doing the job. You know what you're doing. You tell me. Yeah. I'd had other people like the wonderful John Pertwee who gave me such a terrible, terrible time. I'd get halfway through a question and he'd say, no, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. You know, and so I'd say, uh, Keith, get him, tell him to ask me. You know, and I'd be there and he'd, be, you know, so it was a nightmare and I'd, I'd lost a lot of confidence. So you gave me confidence. Oh, I am delighted. It's true. Because the end result has been that you are an addition to the world of Doctor Who and other worlds that is valued by all of us. So I'm glad I gave you that first little step Thank from you. timid obscurity into <laughs> cocky dominance of the Doctor Who world. I don't think I'm cocky or dominant. <laughs> Your yeah. dominance is not by nature. It is just, it has happened. Your talent has shone through and you dominate. Well, you see, I had that thing you said earlier about, I, this is so self-indulgent because it's all about me. The, the thing you said earlier that I had been an actor and given up that, I can't remember exactly when this happened, but there was a point where you said, well, I'll, I'll help you. If you want to get back into acting, I'll help you. And so many uh, of the people I'd interviewed had said that, and none of them had done it. And so I went back to you and said, well, will you? And you went, yeah. And you got me a job in a... <laughs> uh, yeah. and you in said, Sidmouth? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you warned me. You said, you said something like, oh, it's really badly paid and you won't like it, but it will get you back into the whole theatre yes. thing. Yeah. And it absolutely did. And there were very few people that I could ring up and say, look, there's a young actor here who, who can do it, who wants to get back into it, and 
Charles Vance of blessed memory. Yes. I uh, went, yes, Colin, I'll do it for you. And he did. He did. He did. <laughs> it was an incredible audition because he told me right from the word go that I didn't have to audition. He said, I can, <laughs> I can, just, I can just tell from your manner <laughs> that you will be good. And I thought, well... I could be rubbish for all you know. <laughs> and then, of course, when I went to Sidmouth, I realised that he'd done that to a lot of people who were, in fact, rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and when you asked yourself, why did he employ them? You think, oh, I know why, because he didn't audition them. I particularly remember the bill bags were on the train, whatever that was called, in memory alone. That's what Which you wrote, called. didn't you? I did write it, and I was in it. Yeah, that was, for me, one of the standout scripts of that kind of very strange interregnum time when we did those stranger stories and thanks mate and those who watch them still say i love the one on the train and you're the kind of bowler hatted enigma aren't you yeah with a cardboard tie yes it, it was a, it was fascinating and um, we'll, we'll gloss over the the perpetrator of those um videos whose um rather bizarre attitude is that even though DVDs were not even invented then, therefore I don't have to pay you for them. Yeah, that's I, right. I can release them because they, they didn't exist when you did it. And I can take your house and yeah. your family and I can eat them. Because <laughs> That is his actual <clears throat> attitude. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yes, you just reminded me I need to... Uh, have a few conversations. Have a few with conversations the legal with the with the legal profession about that. Thank you for reminding yes. me. But it was yeah we mm. were we were doing a night shoot, weren't we? On in, 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 in. we were. I can't remember where the station was. It was being Nottinghamshire. Probably. I want to say Rothley. Does that make sense? Yes, it I does. Remember, I remember it does. the sign. It yeah. does. What a remarkable memory you have. Well, it was a you know to be quite frank, it was a more significant memory for me because you know I was extremely. I was going to say young, I wasn't that young, but I was very inexperienced, and so it was like a big thing for me. Whereas, you know, one, How one old of... were you when you uh, came to stuck that microphone into my face? At, uh, I, I have no memory of that, but I can imagine myself uh... saying that. I still do it if I'm talking to somebody and somebody comes up with a microphone. It makes me cross. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what was so awful. I couldn't have walked away from that situation thinking, well, that was unreasonable of him. I actually remember thinking, oh, you know, when you're just caught in the wrong situation. He's turned around, he's been having a conversation, and I'm standing here with a microphone. So it how, looks like I've been secretly recording. Well, basically, what I'm saying is, how, how old were you in 1984? Well, I was born in 1961. You're the mathematician. 33. I was 33? Mm. Good Lord. I thought I was a lot no, younger than that. No, you were 23. That. No, I couldn't have been 23. You were born in. 61. And it was 1984, so you were 23. 23. 23, yes. Wow. You were a little kid. I was young, wasn't I? Little kiddie wink. Wow. I probably still had a bit of fluffy hair on my head. <laughs> <laughs> and therefore you'd have still been late 20s when we were doing the big, the, um, the, the stranger stuff. Yeah. I can't wow. remember which ones you wrote. I know you wrote in memory alone. I wrote Breach of the Peace, which is the imitation of the bill. The bill. <laughs> and I <laughs> the David Beholder. Trappen. Yeah. And I the Beholder in a cottage in the middle of nowhere in Oxfordshire. That's right. That's the one where he was desperate to get Nicola Bryant and me in the shower. Was that the one? No, that was uh, the Air Zone Solution. That which was I the also Air Zone wrote, Solution. Which he wrote all that, that romantic stuff between you. I didn't write any of that in the script. And then he showed me the edit, and there you are in bed, and you're having a shower. And I didn't write any of those things. He just sort of put in all this nudity and uh, sexual content. <laughs> Sounds like Caligula, why, doesn't why it? Why <laughs> I fell for it, I have no idea. Well, you know, the funny thing about it is that, for me, I suppose... Uh, I used it as great experience because yeah. as a writer, a wannabe writer, you don't ever, f you have all your first chapters of novels that you write and you never finish them because you don't feel you've got permission to tell your story. Then someone, whoever they are, says, I'll give you this small amount of money to write this, which I will start filming on this date. Then you do it and you complete it. Yeah. And it, it, as, as a writer, you think, I've done something now. And now I know how to do things. So it was useful for me. Do you keep everything you've ever written? Is there a file on your computer, things what I wrote? Uh, yes, I'd never throw away anything. I mean, most of that stuff, I think I typed it on typewriters, actually. So but, it uh, probably won't exist in No, I've got the paper. Digital form? No, a lot of it doesn't. Wow. Yeah. Oh, God, and a lot of it's on old PC discs that I can't, don't work on anything anymore. So, yeah, I, do, I probably... Well, you mean the hard disks from PCs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, not hard disks, the, the, the floppy disks. Oh, the old... Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I archived it all on that. So the the three-inch and the five-inch ones? Yeah. Goodness me. You can get readers.
Yes. So if I wanted to seek them out. Yeah. So technically it all exists. You anyway. lost track. No. I... How many individual stories per story? I know they're of different lengths. Oh. Hundreds? I don't know. I mean, I, I just the other day I made a list of all my big Finnish stuff because someone wanted me, Austin Atkinson, wanted oh, yeah, me yeah. to submit a writing CV to him because he reckons he's going to get me writing for some animation series for in Australia, which, you know, would be great. Uh, and I suddenly, and he said, where's your writer CV? And I said, I've been too busy writing to actually write a CV. <laughs> and then I just listed all my Doctor Who credits for Big Finish. And it is, I didn't count them, but it's a huge list. I'm not, yeah. It might, it might be a couple of hundred things. What I is think. your writing process? Do you, is it idea or is it, I need to write a story about this, this and this, therefore I'll do this. Or are there ideas jostling? Do you ever sit down in front of a blank page and it remains blank? I get the impression you don't. I think that's correct. I don't. Wow. I, I generally, yeah, I, I have all sorts of ideas about. I, I find it really difficult to relax because the moment I relax, I start having ideas about stories, <laughs> and it's a question. And quite often they're Doctor Who stories because those are the things I have permission to write. You know. Yes, of course. Because um, I have to do it. I'm very big on this permission thing. You know, that's the thing when people say, "Oh, I'd love to write, but I don't know what to write," and you've got to believe that people are going to listen or take any notice of what you have to write. So, yeah, I, I mean, of course, with the Doctor Whos, we say, oh, you know, I want you to write a story for, say, you know, Colin's Doctor, and we thought, shall we make it on a spaceship, or, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. But I, I immediately start thinking of ideas I can hang the story on and what the point of the story will be. You know? And all it has to be planned out for approvals processes. I can't just start writing a script and see where it goes, which is a shame. You see, as a very minor writer compared with you oh. um, with my one book of short stories I look at those short stories and maybe with a couple of the eight or nine I knew the total story arc but the, all the rest I chucked a couple of ideas together and let the characters write it for me uh, you don't like that here at Big Finish do you? We, we can't do it because the story has to be approved by the BBC before it's written yeah because otherwise uh, you might, in the process of writing, come up with something that, you know, they feel is off-brand or contradicts or yeah, clashes in some way with the TV series, like they were planning an episode just like it or with extremely similar themes. And it's not so much them being protective of themselves, it's just so that the Doctor Who universe, as it were, isn't crammed with the same ideas. Yeah. You know, and it would be stupid for yeah, us to... Like having a story about... You know, the Doctor and a Dalek, you know, that's in chains and imprisoned and on audio that the Doctor is kind to yeah, yeah. And, and doing the same story, amazingly written by the same author yeah. with a different Doctor. Yeah. That would never happen. That was a deliberate thing, though, wasn't it? <laughs> they said they'd get, you know, Russell T. Davis said, I really love Jubilee and I'd really like to do something like that. But, yeah, they don't do that anymore, really. Right. I mean, those were early days for the TV series. They were sort of learning what the best approach was. But, yeah. And it was that way around as well. They wouldn't like it if you were to semi-plagiarise one of their stories. Well, no. They can do the reverse, but... Uh... Unfortunately, we work at different rates. So, I mean, at time. Uh, and so sometimes we will do something that got approved... And then later on, they'll decide to... Because it doesn't feed the other way. When they write one of their stories, they don't think, oh, does this clash with anything Big Finish does? You know, they don't even think of it. <laughs> they just send them to you for approval. No, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny, wouldn't it? Yeah, so they just write their scripts. And they may... And they have several times come up with ideas just like ours. And they've gone ahead and made it. And then ours comes out either before or after. Or, But it's but, amazing how many but people... But they will have approved it, so... That, it's already approved, yeah. yeah. It's amazing how people don't notice that. What constitutes the same story differs between people's opinions. You know, some people will say to me, God, that's just like so and so. I say, Is it really? I don't care. It's what you th people think stories are about different things. Mm. You know, people focus in on different aspects. Anyway, we better do some work now, haven't we? Had we? Yeah. Oh, I'm enjoying chatting. That's nice. But you've got the licence now till 2016? End of 2016. Fantastic. Yes, yes. Uh, David Richardson, the line producer, said to me, just think how old we'll be in 2016. I said, I'd rather not, thank you very much. I, Actually, I think I emailed that... back, ah! I want someone, not you, you're far too busy, to give make a list 
of the stories as done by all doctors, television and Big Finish. Mm. And I want to know who's done the most stories. Oh. It was me briefly, but now Tom's doing them. I wonder if he's because he'd done such back a lot in the on lead. television. And, yeah. Yes. Hmm. Uh, I thought you were going to ask whether Big Finish has done more stories than the TV series, just generally. Oh, must have done. And, and apparently, we have some uh, chap wrote in, and he, he, yes, he sent us a, a little podcast recording where he demonstrated from various different forms of analyses. It did turn out that we'd done more but you know we just do more and more I realized that halfway through because Gary Russell was producer for seven years and I've this next month I will have been executive producer for seven years really yeah and wow. I realized about three years into my tenure if that's uh, that sounds like it'll it's be over one word. day is it I'm sure it'll never be over um three years into it we had done twice as much as the first seven years because of all really? the extra ranges we do I Oh, yeah. yeah. Not twice as much Doctor Who, but no, no, twice the, as much you can't, you can't You can't get more months into the year because you know, no. it's the monthly range. But, yeah, all the other series you've done, the extra Paul McGann series, the Dalek Empire, the Cybermen, all this kind of stuff, it all mounted up. Well, you could go fortnightly if you wanted to, but presumably the market no, yeah, wouldn't yeah. sustain that. Yeah, one of the biggest criticisms is we do too much. But, you know, once the ball's rolling, you can't really stop it, you know. They're so popular. I wish everyone would buy them rather than pirate Steal them. them. <laughs> yes, but there you go. Uh, well, we're experimenting with things about pricing and stuff, you know. We did a special releases bundle last year where we brought the price right down. And consequently, we sold more. But it's a question of, you know, will you will you sell more, 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 you know? Yeah, can you do... There must be technology that can protect you from... No, Copying? you can't. If you do that, it uh, upsets people even more and want, makes them want to break through it. There, there's basically nothing you can do to stop it being copied that a determined burglar won't break into. Yeah. You, you throw down the gauntlet. And it also, it's, it, it's a bit like you don't trust them. And I think people respond better to being trusted. And it's no point haranguing people about stuff, I don't think. What, what's the first and thing of course, you do if, if someone you buy harangues it, you? You just go and do If you buy a CD, you, you might want to load it onto your well, iPod. Well, they can do that, though, to. but they get a free download with yeah. every CD they buy from us. So. This is like a big finished policy discussion now. <laughs> but I just wanted to say to you, Colin, I always say to people that uh, you're the doctor who I know the best. You're the one who's a mate who, you know, who I could phone up about something and you just chat Anytime to. you like, yes. yes. And even though, since I've been executive producer, I have got to know and love all the others in their own individual ways i have got to know them better which i never thought i was yeah you're you're my first <laughs> oh thank you and you and you know and, and it's I very am nice to hear that because of you because you know the funny thing is that it is very easy to think oh he's got so big and important now that he's forgotten that we have a history oh no never <laughs> no, I'd never forget it no it is the reason i'm here you know, I would have not gone back into acting and I wouldn't have... None of these opportunities would have come my way if you hadn't... Well, it's one of the things I'm proudest of, then. Oh, well, thank you. That I've enabled, in my small way, your talent to come through. And I mean that quite genuinely, because I know we take the piss out of each other <laughs> most of the time, but I do mean that quite gently. I'm quite proud that, even if it's true, not true, you think that I've enabled that somehow. Mm. I think it... I absolutely think it's true. I do. Bless you. Because I was at a concert uh, with the um, Rat Pack. There's a band going around who are the Rat Pack. Right, yes. Um, and the, the Frank Sinatra in that was a Doctor Who fan. He used to hang around outside the theatre at Harlow. And I have little memory of those days, but I was nice to him. And I encouraged him. He said he wanted to be an actor. And I you know, told him what he could do and what he couldn't do. And I went to see one of his concerts. Right at the end, he said, And in the audience we have... The man who made all this possible. And he made me stand up because this man encouraged me when I was a boy. And, and my family were all around me. And it was, it was a lovely moment. That is lovely, and it? it's, it's so easy to overlook the fact when you're rolling along in your career that those hundreds of young, hopeful people who come and say, how do you become an actor then? Um, using, oh, nine times out of ten, oh, go and practice. <laughs> um, but every now and then, if you can stop and, and pay attention, it, the, 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 the snowball that rolls might get 
enormous and it's it's worth giving that time but i mean i've done it with people i thought had something yeah and the usual answer i give when people say yeah i want to be an actor what do i do i say i, I never actually asked that question I didn't care what other people thought. I was just going to batter on doors because I didn't want to be an actor. I needed to be an actor. Yes. And you've got to need it with every fibre of your being. Like you needed to write, clearly. Yes. Yeah. You needed to write. I bet you didn't ask too many people, how did you write, did you? No, no, I've been writing since I was five. You wrote. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it wasn't very good when that I wrote sums it up. Five, but yeah. Well, it probably was for a five-year-old. Yeah. But also with the acting with me as well, you just, you know, you just have to... You want do to it. do it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I never entered this profession with any view of being a star or having a stamp with my face on it yeah, or being or selling my autograph at, at conventions. That wasn't in my mind. I just wanted to be other people and be responsible for people laughing or crying or having a moment of magic. And it's provided moments of magic for me, like talking to you now. Hmm. And on that note, we're going to do some work. Let's do it. Thank you.